pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Alderman Alder? Here. Alderman Flores? Here. Alderman Galloway? Here. Alderman Hutchinson? Here. Alderman Snyder? Here. We have five aldermen present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, just one announcement tonight. As we know, there might be some weather. And also, anyway, in case if the tornado warning goes off, we do have a, a safe, safe place here. At that point, we will immediately adjourn and, and, take, and do, do the right thing. So just one FYI as we start the meeting tonight. At this time, we're going to go to our minutes. The first one we had was a special session we had on March 18th, 2024. Any questions regarding those minutes? If not, entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. And motion was made by Alderman Alder, same by Alderman Hutcherson, that we approve the March 18th, 24 minutes. Uh, all in favor, do so by show of hands. And that does carry. Next, we have our very session, which was March 18th, 2024. Any questions? If not, okay. Okay, and seconded by. Okay, the motion was made that we approve the regular session of March 18th, 2024, made by Alderman Flores, seconded by Alderman Hutchinson. All in favor, do so by show of hands. And that does carry. We moved to our last set of minutes. That was March 21st. And that was, again, a Thursday morning breakfast session. Uh, any questions about those minutes? If not? Make a motion to approve. Okay, and seconded by? Second. Okay, the motion was to approve the March 21st, 2024, our breakfast session that was made by Alderman Alder, second by Alderman Hutchison. All in favor of voting to approve the March 21st minutes, do so by show of hands. And likewise, that does carry. Okay, we have no ceremonial matters tonight, but we, as for scheduled guests and visitors, the Missouri Police Chief Association, they was coming from St. Louis. And because of the incoming weather and all, they've asked to be rescheduled to April 15th. So I know that was on the agenda, but that, that's gonna be moved to the April 15th meeting. So now we're going to move on to item seven, which is the first reading of the bills and resolution, which also this part is open for public discussion. And I always forget to ask the question. Anybody on Zoom? Okay, good. I won't ask you that again. Uh, again, as we do open for public discussion, remember you have five minutes, if, if whoever is speaking, and you only have, you have one time to speak. So if, if you are going to speak, make sure you have all your thoughts together at, at that point. First, we're going to move to bill number, first bill, which is bill number 3546. Your Honor, I make a motion to place bill number 3546 on its first reading by title and description only, please. Okay. Second by? Second. Okay. So, we have bill number 3546 on its first reading by title only. The motion is made by Alderman Snyder, signed by Alderman Flores. All in favor of voting to discuss bill 3546, do so by show of hands. And that does carry. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with Ozark's Coca-Cola Dr. Pepper Bottling Company for an on-site beverage agreement. Okay. Uh, at this time, uh, staff comments. It's going to be our city administrator because our park director, Hayden, his son shared strep throat with him. So he won't be here tonight. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you noted, uh, this is a a uh, uh, contract authorizing an agreement with the Ozarks Coca-Cola slash Dr. Pepper Bottling Company uh, to provide on-site beverage services at the OC. Uh, we did solicit from multiple firms, however, Coca-Cola was the only one to uh, respond. They are our existing vendor there, so uh, continuity of service would be pretty easy from that perspective. Okay. Any questions regarding this potential contract? Okay, uh, at this time I'm going to open up to the public. Is anyone here who wishes to speak for or against bill number 3546? Okay, I'm not seeing any movement, so therefore um, bill number 3546 will be held over to a future meeting.
Moving on, we're going to move on now to bill number 3547. Your Honor, I make a motion that we place bill number 3547 on its first reading by title and description only, please. Okay, second by? Second. Okay. Okay, the motion is that bill number 3547 be placed on its first reading by title only. The motion was made by Alderman Snyder, second by Alderman Alder. All in favor of voting on motion to discuss Bill 3547 would do so by show of hands. And yes, that does carry. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with Carnahan White LLC for fencing. Okay, and again, we'll have. Uh, yes, sir. So um, as you can see, we've got some photos here of the fencing that's going to be replaced. Um, this is fencing at the uh, Finley River Park. Uh, you'll note that it's in pretty significant disrepair. This is at our ball fields there. Uh, we solicited bids for this project. We received two. Um, Carnahan White was the lowest by approximately twenty-five dollars to $30,000. Um, so we are recommending the board enter into a contract with them. Uh, Parks Department did work with community development to ensure that uh, we obtain the appropriate permissions and permits for uh, working in the floodplain down there, which is something that uh, is pretty important to us. Okay, staff wise, yes, Alderman Snyder. Yes, sir, what is the expected completion date on this? <laughs> you would have to ask me that. Well, it said in the contract. Uh, it, I know it, they're going to work April through the, the summer um, yeah. balancing out with the, sorry, Mayor, I'm probably talking right over you. Uh, the, yeah, the, uh, we'll be working, I think, into the late summer with this um, because we'll be balancing it out with the, the ballpark uh, activities. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, at this time, since this is open for first reading, anyone from the public wish to speak regarding Bill 3547 or against? Okay. Thank you. Um, therefore, Bill 3547 will be held to a future meeting. This time, we'll go to our third bill, which is Bill number 35548. Your Honor, I move we place Bill number 3548 on its first reading by title only okay seconded by Second. okay okay the motion is to place bill number three five four eight on its first reading by title only the motion was made by alderman gataway same by alderman alder all in favor of voting to discuss bill three five four eight do so by show of hands and that does ca carry an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a development agreement with jlk plus three llc okay and i believe our attorney will be Speaking? Yes, I would be happy to walk you through this proposed contract. This contract is related to the property at 101 West Church Street for the development of a building. Um, due to the size of the lot, there needs to be a potential reconfiguration of that, and this contract sets forth the next step for that to later be discussed after engineering survey work and a site plan is developed. So the ideal lot size would be 30 feet by 87 feet. Um, that would entail potentially the city reconfiguring the right of way along for, um, North First Street. This is the section of North First Street between Church Street and Brick Street. And in that proposed agreement, the developer is proposing to cover the cost of removal and replacement of the infrastructure um, themselves. The um, proposed agreement also addresses the design concept for the future building, and that is referencing the design book that's attached to the contract, so that's included in your packet. And the city would also anticipate potentially reconfiguring the northern part, part of the lot to encompass um, a sewer main that will be engineered and designed um, to accommodate a sewer main that runs um, within the property line. With that, I'm happy to open up for any questions. Alderman Snyder. Are there any concerns with, uh, with our public works right now with those sewer or water mains? Any concerns we need to be aware of? Currently on the northern side of that lot, basically what you've got is a, a, a sewer main that services from the, uh, the beloved cabin over here on the corner where the Ozark Bank sign is and runs due west. Um, and that main, uh, after doing some title research and whatnot, or doing some initial research, uh, there's no easement in place and it actually runs across private property. Concerns? 
course, we want to be able to service those properties. We want to be able to adequately, you know, distribute that sewer and then treat it. Um, but I think in this scenario, what they're putting before us tonight, that I'll actually establish an area for that sewer main. So. Okay. And the, uh, the next question I have uh, with respect to this, I believe the plan indicated that we, there would be a, uh, a piece of property that was going to be a trade-off to the city for this. Can you explain that to me, please? Yes, so this agreement just sets forth the intent. So we do anticipate an additional agreement coming before the Board of Aldermen that will discuss the specifics of any sort of uh, property reconfiguration for the footprint of the building. But this agreement does anticipate potentially three feet needed on the eastern property line, um, and that would be um, encompassing some of the city's sidewalk and right of way, and then potentially reconfiguring the northern property property line um, to essentially encompass the sewer main or an additional sewer main, whatever ends up being the most feasible in that situation. So you're essentially trading the property from the eastern property line for additional property at the northern property line, if I've got my directions right. And this agreement just establishes that intent. And the reason that staff and the proposed developer felt it was appropriate to just establish the intent is because we really need to look at the survey work and the engineering and a site plan. And once we have those factors in place, we can then come back with an additional agreement that sets forth that swap. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, Alden Hutcherson. Um, just a question about if the sidewalk is relocated to the east, then where it will have to continue, will the city have to relocate their sidewalk as well? And who will bear the cost of that? The, um, that is addressed in the agreement on the second page under the um, new infrastructure, and that would be um, borne by the developer. And so at this point, the developer has proposed uh, to cover the cost of the removal of the sidewalk. The, defi the definition of the project is for that whole block, and so it is uh, proposed to be um, removed and replaced by the developer. So the entire sidewalk from Church Street to, to uh is that? Brick Street. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Would be replaced by the developer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You have another question, ma'am? No. Okay. Anyone else for open to the public? It's not discussed specifically in here, but we also would attempt to work with Liberty to bury the power line um, that crosses First Street. It would make all the sense in the world while we've got the street opened up to try to work with them to get that underground instead of draping the line. So I know that's not part of this, but it would be a nice ancillary benefit to moving forward with the project. Okay, since this is the first reading, we'll go ahead and open to the public. Um, I'm going to first open up, anyone here to speak for this bill, bill number 3548. Okay. Good evening. Yeah. My name is John Torgerson, 130 Sherwood Forest Lane, and that's Ridgedale, Missouri, 65739. I am the managing member for JLK Plus 3, so I am the developer behind this. Uh, we propose that as an office building, so I'm here to answer questions. I think we presented the design intent. So I don't know if I have further to add on, on that, but I just wanted you to know that I am here if there's questions that come up. Okay. I think Alderman Snyder. Mr. Torgerson, uh, the last time we talked, and I, I did, I did like some of the things I saw, but one of the questions that I had asked is if you had actually reached out to some of your potential neighbors here, just to get their input. Uh, the neighbor to the west, we have an ongoing, he was out of town last week, but we have a meeting coming up just to talk about how that would set there. So that's a meeting coming up, um, but that's the only one I've talked to since then. Okay. Hey, do you have any intent to try to reach out to any more? I'm available. I think everybody knows where I am. If they'd like to have a, a conversation, love to talk about it. All right. Thank you. Yes, I'm Galloway. <clears throat> building that's immediately adjacent to the, the lot. Uh, to the west? Yeah, to the west. So that, that I guess that landowner. That building, um, I take it your intent for your building is to have a the, its exterior wall on that western side about, I mean, be just right next to that, that exterior wall. 
Correct. And that exterior wall has not been exposed to the elements since I don't know when. Do you know? Uh, it's been there a long, long time, but no, I, I don't have exact dates. But um, <clears throat> well, how how do I weigh that in terms of uh, that exterior wall being exposed to the elements and whatever protection? Can I say that your building provides protection for that exterior wall, or is that not the right way to look at it? That would probably be. I mean, two things. The first thing is structurally in independent. Okay. Our building has to be independent. I can't rely on their systems. That's your building code. So it will stand independently. But on the ends, which would be the north and the south, that cavity would be closed. And then as my building is a little bit taller than the neighbor, where mine starts to go above that, we would flash his into ours. So the cavity's closed. At that point, there's no elements. It becomes an airspace, but it's a closed space. Is, that a, is it fair to say that would be a desirable result in terms of protecting the wall, or is that a fair, or, or can I say that at all? Yeah, we plan to meet, and I've offered our engineers to talk to that building uh, owner. We've got a meeting, hopefully soon, um, to allow him to speak directly to our engineers and detail that properly. But that would, if I owned that adjacent building, that's how I would want it, so that that is closed. So we, we don't want moisture in that cavity. Moisture is what deteriorates elements. And so we want to close that up to make, make sure it's moisture tight. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Alderman Flores. <clears throat> I was looking at it today, and I think I came up with about seven feet behind the building between the curb that's right now behind City Hall. There's a curb that's standing there. It looks like you have about 14 feet where the current building was standing, you're going back another seven feet, is that correct? As far as how far you're pushing back the to best, the north? Yeah, until we do survey work is, is what was mentioned. The best we can determine that's on the plats today is that length that we own is 92 feet. So we would reduce the 92 to approximately 87. I spoke with public works director and we know there's gonna be some engineering. The ROI, I mean, we have squeezed a lot of information into that 87 feet. Can I go to 86 to make the sewer work? Yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. Do I want to? No. But if push comes to shove, we will make sure that that, that works. Um, if we find out that it can't be done, then it can't be built. You know, But we've entered into a design intent to go forward to allow that in, in engineering to take place. So the best I know today is we think it's about you know six feet. Roughly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Alma um, Hutcherson. I was looking at the one ordinance we have that seems to address new buildings within the historic registry district and um, how it reads as new construction should be designed for compatibility with the neighboring properties in terms of scale and massing, materials, setback, and roof design, but should not attempt to mimic historic buildings and cause confusion. So I thought, well, what exactly does that mean? There are a lot of words there that are probably architectural words. And, um, and so I started doing a little research. And according to um, another National Historic District, which that's what Ozark is, and they have excellent new building guidelines according to the professional resources I also asked and tapped into. And uh, the definition of scale means how does it relate to the buildings around it how does it feel on a human level to pedestrians? Um, and in the really nice pictures, and this is a beautiful building, um, but they're not, it doesn't seem like taking from the view of a pedestrian or even the vehicles that would be going on our streets because it's a very, very small district. This district was built when the population was less than 3,000 people. And I think quite a bit smaller than that. And so there's not a lot of historic building um, left around the square, but still that says a lot about the character of our city and that's how people identify our city. Um, so how does it look from the sidewalks and even from the vehicles in our small tight square? How will that feel? Will it have the charm that I hear from my sister and her friends that come from St. Louis to spend money here three times a year and that's where they head? Um, I don't know, I can't tell. Um, 
that's what people seem to think about Ozark and identify with Ozark. And then the massing, that term, refers to the buildings that are similar in size. And I appreciate, you explained before, I think, that the three stories won't replicate kind of bookends to that block. And I'm, uh, that's really um, a positive thing and that they will echo the Maysher building on the other end of the block. But it, your building will exceed the footprint and width and the height, which is visible and perceived from the public traffic ways, which is part of that definition from the other place on massing, that um, it's the perception of it. And if you're coming from, the, and the roof design as well, which is what something that they refer to. If you're coming north to south, the first thing you'll see is, um, it's really a cool looking, in a modern district, um, the um, projection you'll have on the top of the roof, the arch, everything. Um, <clears throat> but that's the first view you'll see coming into the square and it looks massive. And I'm afraid it'll dwarf the historic buildings in the whole district. Because these, these buildings don't operate as individual buildings. It's not a strip center. It's not individual buildings, but a district. Um, and then going on to the one of the last things is the materials. And it says, this includes window to wall, solid to void, which is what that defines, that is seen traditionally. Large solid areas of glass, as seen in the southeast corner of this proposed building, are not compatible. The ratio of wall to window should be similar to that of historic buildings within the neighborhood. And all these terms do apply to a district, and not standalone buildings, not strip malls, but it's a joint venture where all design should complement, not compete, or be individualistic. It's a place or a destination. Um, <clears throat> so that is my first concern, is that it does not meet our ordinances, the words in the ordinance that address the architectural details. And then my second concern is that we recently did a strategic plan, the staff and the elected officials, and identified three strengths of our city. One was the safety, thanks to our excellent police department. And, um, but the major one was the historic district. And what's that gonna do if we don't keep in tune with not to replicate, not to fool the eye, but to have the same kind of scale, massing materials, setback on roof design. Um, I also appreciate the bricks that you were going to use because they will, um, they would look, have that same kind of context. And I guess that's the whole, the whole issue that I have is this district is all in context with each other. It's what the buildings look in context with the ones right next to them, inches apart, if not conjoined. And then the third thing is I'm, a, I'm concerned about the undesirable precedent for future developers and their request to be given an out for designs that don't comply with our ordinances. Um, this is a beautiful building design and it would be a great signature building for the LCRA land. Uh, one that people would use as a landmark in moving here and it was the historic district that brought my family here. Um, and 13 years ago, in the last 13 years, I hear people over, well, you know where that farm was over there with the red barn? There are landmarks within our city, and this building could be one of those landmarks. But I don't think it fits within the district. It wouldn't contribute to pedestrian traffic. It'd be like a stop sign that are walk for people who are walking down the block from shop to shop. It's not human scaled. So it wouldn't contribute to that charming feeling that people expect from downtown Ozark. It wouldn't continue to the sales tax base, which is what we want for the downtown. And it would require many parking spaces as your business grows it, I have no doubt it will, because you have solid architectural um, projects in many areas of the nation. Um, the vacant lot is an opportunity to achieve all of these goals, and I hope, I hope that you'll choose to build that building but maybe not in the historic district. Was there a question in that for me? Would you be uh, willing to look at these elements that, that meet our ordinance requirements? Well, I disagree on your quoting something not from our area that is not 
that is not an attachment or anything that I know of that you're quoting from Ozark, Missouri. I appreciate what they're trying to do. The, uh, you mentioned something about footprint width and depth, and it doesn't meet that guidelines. It certainly does meet that guideline, so I'm not sure what you're referencing on width and depth. Uh, window patterning is exactly the same as we have elsewhere, except for the modern piece that doesn't confuse people. That's why it's there. The other thing is height. When you're at human view, which is what you're seeing on your screen, it is the same height as uh, other buildings. So as you experience that building in the downtown, it is pedestrian friendly. It does promote that same attitude of downtown. You have worse precedents, Ozark Bank, the log cabin. This is a much better compromise than what could be there according to your ordinance today. So unless you want something different, then you need to change your ordinance because this does meet the compatibility. So I disagree with you on, on those things. That's why the roof is pushed back. Your current code calls for distinctive roof forms in this area. That's what I've given. So by ordinance today, that building meets every criteria. You're defining compatibility on a subjective area which we would disagree on. So I guess I'm here as a developer. I can leave that, that block empty. We can build elsewhere to answer that, that question. We do own other land. It is my passion to build on the square. That's where our, our home is. Don't have to be there. If the board disagrees, we go elsewhere. We, we have choices. But I think this does fit. This does promote your ordinance exactly how it's written today. That's my opinion. So appreciate your concerns. And we can, that, that was the ordinance, the rest of the definitions were when I look, went looking for just definitions for those words that are used yeah. commonly, so. But I would say if you're going to use a definition, it needs to be included in your ordinance. That would mean in that section, it would define what that means within that section. It does not, it leaves it for subjective disagreements and debate just like this, which is healthy. That's how we compromise. And we've done that. This is not our first design for this space. We have compromised and softened it because we are trying to fit. It is my passion to fit. Okay. Any more? No, we can, we'll agree to disagree even about the definitions because we couldn't define everything in all of our ordinances, but there are commonly used terms, so. But thank you for that explanation. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, Alden Galloway. Um, the idea that your building does not uh, contrib would not contribute to the tax base, is that accurate? What, what were you going to put in the bottom story? Right now we have a tenant space, yep. We have not locked in what that tenant type would be. Um, the potential is retail. Business, retail, I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's a good fit for several things. As soon as we move forward and we can design further and we can have definites, then I will start marketing that. I would love to have retail. I'm a fan of retail on the square. It's a nice, you know, mix. Um, so that's our intention, but I, I can't guarantee it tonight. How many parking spaces do you think your building will create? Well, right now there is office for about 35 people in, in that building. So it's taking the load that's already on the square and shifting it to the north side from the east side. Um, but as we continue to grow, I had hoped, you know, I've talked to the city and many times in, in past about some shared parking and those kind of things that would help promote downtown. I'm a big advocate for that. Uh, putting this one-way street adds another 10. That's priceless in my opinion. Um, so we're trying to find again that compromise to have a win-win in all categories. Yeah, the, um, I'm not sure if the solution to adding to downtown and its health is to create smaller buildings so that there won't be as many people to park. Um, uh, but you, what you are saying is, is that 
you're going to be adding by uh, the agreement with the city about 10 parking spaces. Yeah, currently we have about 22 employees, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to fill the building at some point that would bring us to 30, 35. So if we added 10, we're balanced, at least for us, but it's, as you know, it's first come, first serve. Sure. <laughs> and uh, the hope is, is your tenants will be shopping downtown. Sure, with their and our employees. Yeah, as far as the ordinance is concerned, I mean, that ordinance is so big you could drive a bus through it, park it, and call it a historic building from what I saw. Is that about what you... Yeah, it's, you know, it's open to interpretation because there's a couple of words to define that aren't defined. And so you have to look for what that means. Uh, the word compatible is the biggest one in there. And it's finding somebody that has passion to make it compatible. And I think that's what we've done tonight. I mean, if, if we could have that photograph uh, again of that building as proposed, photograph, uh, not the interior design, but the exterior. There, there. So, you know, what I'm looking at <coughs> is a mostly brick facade on the east side and you develop the bricks in such a way that it, they looked older so they don't can you explain that well typically really straight lines thin grout lines that's more of a modern clean look where we intend to use more of a tumbled look that is more casual which is typically more historical when you say that uh you took some design elements uh, from the windows of the windows from around the square, what particular design elements did you pick up? Well, first you start with the window itself. It's a replica of a more historical double hung type window. And then the detailing, the window sills, how we arch the top, the key lock at the very top on the arches, uh, just the proportion and patterning of those openings are very typical of other buildings. Um, in terms of being as to scale, I mean, I, I'm just a family law lawyer and I certainly am not an architect or an engineer. Uh, why would you say that would be to scale? Well, using, using your industry terms. Sure. Looking at heights on all sides of the square. I mean, proportions are developed not just from a neighboring building, but from the entire square the courthouse, the Justice Center, all of those help set precedents for proportion. And that sets a fabric for the pedestrian way. So you're really balancing that on all four sides. Um, it's a bookend, it's a corner. Your ordinance says that the ones on the corner should be taller, grander. Uh, that's a little bit about what we've done, but it's balanced on the Northwest building of that same block height-wise. We purposely have pushed that little penthouse corner back so that from a street view, from a pedestrian view, from a human scale, it is proportional to all other buildings on the square. I mean, it seems to be the, the same size as the, the other corner building. Is, is and if right? you look further to the east on the north side, they're again, very similar proportions. And as I look at the sides there, it does seem to be mostly brick. Really, there's two materials here, brick and window curtain wall. We don't really have a, a second material. So yes, it's, you know, 80% brick. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at a picture of historic Bentonville's downtown, which is probably one of the most successful Agreed. downtown rehab uh, examples in the Midwest. I, I'm looking at a building on a corner uh, on the square that has uh, a bank of windows and of modern windows and brick, but none of the several arched windows um, none of the kind of historic references that you see and yet i'm i'm looking at a picture it really doesn't stand out i uh, i guess that's the concern that i see from 
Alderman Hutchison, I mean, how would this not fit in? I, I, I mean, are, are you seeing that? No, and that and and that's what I said a few a few minutes ago. I mean, our team has worked months and months to come up with something that doesn't trick, as your or ordinance says. We we don't want to confuse, but we need it to be compatible, and so we're trying to define that. I have to have a building that fits our footprint. We got it to work on that little posted, you know, site. Mm -hmm. um, the proportions, the depth, the width all of that is exact similarity of what's downtown at the sidewalk height where you experience it in a human scale it's similar of all other buildings when you step back and maybe look across the the square you will see a penthouse and a roof garden but you also see that in other places so to us the compatibility is it's checked all the boxes it has materials of downtown it has proportions of downtown it has the approach from the sidewalk to the entries, everything that your ordinance has said, I think my last presentation had six categories that your ordinance has asked for. I think we've checked five and a half of those boxes. So to us, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm really disappointed because we are passionate about this. This is not something that you know we sketched up last night. We have worked on this for quite a while to find something that works for the bank, that works for the appraisals, that works for the staff, that works for everything we have to have that building do, and yet is compatible with downtown. So that's the ask tonight is, that's why we put this developer agreement. If you prefer, I'll leave a vacant lot. That's not what I wanna do. That's not my legacy. I, I wanna leave something here that really fits, but it has to work. Well, and, and about that, we do have precedent for a vacant lot on a corner on a highly trafficked side of the square, the west side of the square. How long has that been vacant? As long as I've been here. How long has that been? 2010. And so the risk for us, for this town, of just having, is having uh, our square just diminish lot by lot as we depend upon the structures of these old towns. And we hope that someone will go through this. We do have financing approval. We've turned that in. We're waiting on final. The bank knows that we have a contract in, in place. So we are ready to go once we execute this contract. We have the month of April to finalize designs and work with your staff to meet all the building codes. but. Tonight is the ask that we meet some type of a design intent so we know how to go forward. Thanks. English from the board. Yes, sir. Uh, one question I had is on the front of the building, the Torgerson design partner signed and everything, is that all backlit? Is that, is that the intent of it or is it no, just no. We, we I've sent that to the signed vendor and, and we're working through the logistics but you actually have more information on your sign ordinance for this area than you do your building. So we'll look at that and see. Um, we'll, you know, there's not really place to light it. Um, I know our neighbors are sensitive and we know that. I appreciate that. So that's something that we'll work together. We, we do want some soft light, security light and that, those kind of things, but I don't, know enough about the sign ordinance in this area i'm expecting that probably a backlit light is prohibited so work we're working through that my second question would be the the roof line on the fourth the fourth level up there being on a curve like that um would you interpret that as being with the ordinance that we have as it is well again you... it's it's specifically asking i mean your or ordinance word for word on a corner is asking for distinctive roof line. There's no definition in your ordinance of what distinctive means. So you're leaving that for interpretation for a designer like me. So I'm trying to find a, something that works, that looks good, that is our large conference room, that is our main conference room. So that is the penthouse, you know, that's the expensive real estate, you might say. That's a roof garden and those kind of things. So yes. It's a very soft arch. It's not aggressive. You know, it's not 
modern by any means in my definition. Um, I think it's tasteful, it's distinctive, but it's also telling the visitors when they look at that building that is not a historic building, which is a box that we have to check. Anyone else? Thank you very much for free time. Okay, Appreciate thank it. you. Okay. okay. This time, uh, it, someone here regarding Bill 354A who wished to speak, well, it, it, uh, say speak against, since we've had this four. It's, the floor is open this time. Okay. Okay. Come up. Yeah, come up to the mic, introduce yourself, sir. And uh, Steve Devine, I own the building next door, the ugly wall. Uh, I got more questions, you know. Uh, my first question would be, why is the city going to give him three feet when you can one way it with some stripes tonight? I mean, what's, what's the city getting out of this extra three feet? You can one way First Street, you can put the parking in. How much of that parking is going to be city hall only? How much of it's going to be the tour? Is I'm going to get five to six feet. Okay, can no longer get a truck back there. They're talking like they're going to put sewer gas, water, electric, and contels back there on a five-foot easement. The roof line, is that encroaching on me? Is it draining to the back? I've already got the city hall building encroached on me a foot and a half, so now his roof is going to encroach over on me. We talked about a two-inch gap. Is that two inches from the curve, two inches from, it's going to end up six, eight inch gap because of the way the roof curves in the chimneys. I mean, where are we taking the two inch gap between the buildings? You can't get two inches because of the way the chimneys are. If you knock the chimneys off, then you can maybe get your two inches. That wall is covered with asbestos, latex, lead base. For me to seal that, i got to get a COA from the Historic Society and use their weak stuff, their sealer, you know, because it's antique brick. So this space between them is a concern of mine. When they dig this foundation, nobody, since the building collapsed, nobody has looked at my foundation. It's stacked limestone with an oak board that's rotting because it's at ground level. And the brick are piled on top of that. Okay, so when he digs, he's going to dig, I'm assuming, deeper than my foundation. You know, what's that do for my stability? You know, I'm only going to be around 20 years. I don't care if it crumbles after that. I invested in Ozark, the historic society. I don't live here, so, you know, I don't have the same argument as these other folks. But... The, the sign on 3rd Street says historic downtown district. And the whole purpose was to keep another Ozark bank out. Yeah, maybe I can get to my notes now. Uh, okay, back to my, they can talk about the historic and how it doesn't fit. I have to get a permit from, from historic society to put a sign up. It can't be lit. I mean, it can with goose lights, but it can't be neon. It can't be the biggest sign in Ozark. Uh, so the curved roof, does that drain on to City Hall? Or does it curve on to me? I, it looks in this picture, again, I can't get a picture or a site plan from anybody. It looks to me like it's going to be dumping on City Hall's building, but it's encroaching on me. I've been pushed into a hole. So here's the deal. That's been a hundred year old alley back there. My attorney is ready to file a prescriptive easement. So 
if you want to give him three feet, I'll tell my attorney to include the city of Ozarks three, well, I guess it'd be his, but I'm, I'm filing for a prescriptive easement because I want my 15 foot alley. It's been there a hundred years. There's no way they can get five, all that sewer, water, gas, electric, they're all there. The sewer main runs within, like according to the picture, a foot from, you know, where the old building was. Spires back there, the day it collapsed. And, and then my questions keep going. When they start building this, they're gonna cut off the utilities to my tenants. They're gonna put up fence and block the parking to the DMV like they did when the building collapsed. I didn't have cracks in my building until they were done with their demolition. I got brick holes in my awnings from the fallen bricks when they did their demolition. This is without my notes. Uh, so, I mean, I got all kinds of, but it, it pretty well boils down to why is the city giving up three feet of precious downtown square when you can do it one way and put the parking in now and not have to move the sidewalks? And just another thought, the city has no easement. So if they want to get to this tower back here, there's no way in. If they want to paint and restucco like they did a couple years ago back there, you're trespassing on me. You know, with his five foot easement, you can get to there, but your encroachment of a foot and a half that's sitting on me now and the, uh, the dumpster, that foot and a half sitting on me now, I don't have an easement on Rojo Iguana to come in that way. Where are the dumpsters gonna go? Where are the HVAC units gonna go? How am I gonna fix the antique brick on the back of my building if I can't get a truck in there? Those are just the questions. I, I probably have more, but uh, right now the city recognizes a 12 and a half foot, there's a road cut. You know, I parked back there as we speak. It's, I mean, the city's recognized it. The, the, the alley's been back there a hundred years. Uh, the two inch thing, I'm still, you know. Uh, is there gonna be handicap? Is there gonna be a time limit on that, on that parking along there? You know, otherwise the imps are gonna park there and they're gonna be there all day. So it, right now they, they rotate so that the people can get to the DMV. Now I know people don't like the DMV down there, but it brings a hundred people or more a week that are looking at this building, my building, everybody else's, stopping to buy, you know, along the way. I'm not very good public speakers. So you have to excuse me. I get, I'm the kid that sat in the back, so. Uh. Well, did any other aldermen have questions? Or, yeah. I do. Alderman Snyder. So Sir, you? how, when you access your alley, um, yes, how many feet do you actually need? Do you have adequate space now, or is that just enough? It's tight now, and it's, it's about, depending on how you measure it, the, the city's got a cut of a 12 and a half. Uh, 15 is what I heard that most utility companies want for sewer. I mean, all this stuff's gonna be buried back there. Sewer, water, gas, electric, contail. Uh, it, it, rough tape measure, there's about 17 feet, depending on that curb that kind of messes things up. But, you know, at least, you know, MoDOT is 10 feet to get a, you know, a semi, you gotta be a good backer, but you could back a semi in, cause the maximum is eight feet for a, unless you get the wide sign when they're, but 10 foot is minimum a, a, a dot, Department of Transportations. Uh, I know utility companies want 15 feet. So 
Well, it would be safe to say, sir, one of your, your major concerns is my alley is, is the alley and your access points to get in and out. Absolutely. I've got, you know, restaurants that come and go, the, the Pepsi man, the dumpsters are going to have to, you know, roll out to the street or in one of these parking spots. The trash truck is going to, or the vendors are going to have to park in the road, you know, to service the back. I mean, yeah, they could service it through the front, but, you know, most of them don't. So it's another, I mean, the city's not got an easement across me. So if you ever want to touch the back of your building again, you got to come to me. Gotcha. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I, and I, I proposed, I don't know if the city attorney ever got it, I would give a complete easement back there if the city would seek a prescriptive easement across that the one-on-one lot. If they'll get a prescriptive easement for that 15 feet, I'll gladly sign my 15 feet. That way I don't have to go, you know, it's selfish. Otherwise, I got to go pay my attorney because I will file. And I'll, I'll just need to know whether I'm including you know, the, the extra three feet of the city or how this is going to go down. But, you know, it's on my attorney's desk. And all I got to do is pull the trigger. I, I hate being back then. I want to be a neighbor. I want a nice building. You know, I'm the one with the ugly wall. I want it covered. That's what they, you know, they know me by. I'm looking at this historic mural behind you, and then I see this. You know, it doesn't fit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anyone else here wish to speak tonight? Yes. I'm Steve Stead. So I'm, I've been there a year. I'm, going, I'm starting my second year as of today. Um, one of the things that oh. brought me... Oh, sorry. Christine Dix Vandenberg. Okay, this is your story. Yeah, Thanks. sorry. You know, um, when I came down to the square, we were in a building across the, the way. We were just in a little, in that back corner. When Steve's property come available a year ago, I jumped. I, I've sunk a lot of money into that, that store to try to bring more people in. I was at a partnership. I'm now a sole owner as of today. Today is my first day as sole owner. I've sunk another quite a few thousands and bringing that store up to making it look to bring people in. You don't have any restaurants, but one on downtown at the square. I have a full kitchen in the back. I'm trying to bring in some things so that people can eat there or at least come in and get a sandwich, taco, or you know, just different things. I haven't finished my menu because this is all new to me. I have done fairly well on the square. And one of the things that I get is, I love your building when they walk in. That looks like a parking garage in a big city. I'm sorry, but that whole one corner, that's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a parking garage. It doesn't remind me of office buildings. That corner just reminded me of that. I've been in my store every day, almost continuously, and no one ever come and ask me any questions. At any given time, I could have been, hey, you know, I knew that there was gonna be a building built there. I was told it was gonna be a small boutique. It was gonna really filter into the um, square's um, uniqueness of all the old buildings. I didn't have a problem with that. That being there, you got, he's roughly 35, you know, employees. He's potentially, where's the parking coming? I can't even park in front of my store nine times out of 10. And I get there at nine o'clock almost every morning. I cannot park on that, that one street. Half the time I'm on first street. Every now and then I can pull up in front. You're putting that many people, you're roughly 10. You're still what, 25 parking spots? And I will tell you right now, Every day I see three to five people going the wrong way in front of my store. Do you know where they turn? On that street. So 
now they're going another block down the wrong street because it's one way. There's not enough parking at that, at that area for all of us. I have enough to, a hard time with my customers who are like, where do we park? I don't know. I don't know where to tell them. I love the square. It's the reason I chose to keep to stay a second year. I love the atmosphere. I love the oldness. That is what brought me to the square. I am, you know, in my 50s. And let me tell you, to start a new, new life by opening a boutique and doing this and sinking a lot of money was not in my plans. <laughs> I was looking at more or less trying to retire in a few years. <laughs> I didn't. I have sunk a lot into this. And I'm afraid if with all that construction, I will have to close my boutique. I will not be able to afford to keep it open when I have no customers with all the um, traffic of the, all that new construction being that much construction. That's not something that can be done overnight. You know, that's a lot of money I'm going to be losing and still have to pay my rent. I don't see that happening. The guy above me, he works from home. He has his own office up there, you know, he's not going to have any peace either. I mean, just all the noise. Before the, 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 the tenant moved in up there last year, the one that was there before, my customers would complain because they dogs, you know, it's so noisy. I get that. But can you imagine the noise that we are going to have to put up with, with this kind of building? and all the construction and reworking things. Am I going to lose my electricity? I'm losing money every way around. How, are we, how can we justify this? I don't see it being justified. And that is nowhere close to being looking like downtown Ozark. That to me looks like a garage. It's a garage. It is not. I think we need to really look at this, guys, and I'm sorry. I don't live here, but I have a business, and I have a lot that I put into this. Thank you. And I think, you know, that needs to be said. Anyone have questions for her? I didn't want. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anyone else who wish to speak during this time? I'm not seeing movement. I just want to make sure I didn't want to cut anybody off. Okay, I'm going to close that. Okay. So, any last response from the board? Okay. Since this is first reading, bill number 3548 would be held over for a future meeting. Now we're going to go to second readings of, of two bills, and these are closed now to public discussion since this is the second reading. We'll now turn to bill number 3544. Yeah, the, the 3544 will be placed in the second and final reading by title only. Second by. Okay. So bill number 3544 and second reading by title only. Motion is made by Alden Hutcherson, same by Alderman Snyder. On fair voting to discuss bill 3544, do so by show of hands. Yes, that carries. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with Altex Solutions Group Incorporated for information technology services. Okay. Uh, do we, staff com comments, do you have any questions about this? If there are any questions, uh, myself or oh. the director of finance okay. would be happy. Oh, there you are. I didn't see you. I, was just <laughs> I thought you was here. Okay. Do you have any questions for, for them? Okay. Okay. Uh, Second by. Okay. So bill number 3544 to become ordinance number 24-029. The motion was made by Alderman Hutchison, same with Alderman Snyder. Roll call, please. Alderman Galloway. Aye. Alderman Alder, Aye. Alderman Flores, Aye. Alderman Snyder, 
Alderman Hutchinson? Aye. We have five aye votes. Motion carries. Thank you. We're moving now to our final bill, which is bill number 3545. Your Honor, I move that we place bill 3545 on its second reading by title and description only. Yeah. Okay. The motion is that we place bill number 3545 on its second reading by title only. The motion was made by Alderman Flores. It was said by Alderman Snyder. All in favor of voting to discuss bill 3545, do so by show of hands. And that does carry. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with Missouri American Water Company for the acquisition of the Spring Valley water system. Okay. And we have Director Parson. Any questions for him? Yes, no, sir. Just, I just want to verify that uh, the new equipment that we installed here, the metering equipment, will be applicable to this too as well? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, the five-year rollout that we have, assuming that this sale goes through, remember we've got to go to the PSC, um, but all the meter equipment that we're purchasing will be um, completely compatible with the meters that we're getting out there. So. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay. I'm not seeing any. I move that we adopt Bill 3545 as Ordinance 24-030. Okay. okay, the motion is that we adopt Bill 3545 as Ordinance Number 24-030. Motion is made by Alderman Flores, same by Alderman Snyder. Roll call, please. Alderman Snyder? Aye. Alderman Hutchinson? Aye. Alderman Alder? Aye. Alderman Galloway? Aye. Alderman Flores? Aye. We have five aye votes. Motion carries. Now we'll move on. We have some reports. We're going to begin with our interim city administrator, Ben DeClaire, on the City of Ozark 23 annual report. Oh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, included in your packet is our 2023 annual report. Um, we're excited to uh, hand that out to you tonight. Uh, I'm not going to bore everybody by walking you through it, um, but it's essentially a, a look back at the activities of you know, uh, your city uh, over the past year. Um, and if it's not already available online, it certainly will be first thing in the morning uh, for any resident to download as well. Uh, you know, we think it's important to get this kind of information out so that they can understand just what services they get from their government. Um, I think uh, I'll touch on just one or two. Um, I was really impressed with what our communications team was able to come up with um, for the finance department's breakdown. Um, I kind of challenged them to show the residents, uh, you know, sort of the proportionality of their property tax dollar. And the question is, you know, how much of your dollar is going to special road district or the school district or the county versus the city? And I think people will be very shocked to see just how small of that dollar uh, breakdown goes to the city versus these other taxing entities. So, you know, we frequently hear from folks that, you know, they think the city you know, is who they're paying, you know, all this property tax money to. And it's not always the case. So hopefully it provides a little bit of education um, when the city does request some additional funding. Uh, mechanisms from the public, uh, and they'll begin to understand a little bit better of, of, of just how their dollar is broken down well, when they pay it every year. Um, other than that, um, you'll also note, you know, we do include the police department in the annual report. The police department also does their own departmental report, um, which uh, Chief will be talking about next. Um, we also had enough material this year from Public Works that uh, the communications staff is discussing breaking them out into an annual report as well. Um, so you might get a more detailed look here in the very near future at the activities of Public Works, which of course covers our water and wastewater in addition to our street service. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to field them uh, about this, and I've got just one or two more uh, announcements after that. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I'm not seeing. Thank you, sir. Um, for the other announcement, um, our recruiter did reach out to me, wanted to remind me um, that our uh, application period for the city administrator position closes on the 8th. Um, we currently are sitting at about 30 applications. Um, of that, uh, he says he's focused in particularly on approximately 10 that he considers to be very highly qualified. So uh, we still do have a week. Applications do tend to kind of come in late for these kind of positions, um, but so far a very good turnout. But next, we turn to the um, police department annual report, and chief will be coming up. I'm disappointed. I thought all these people were here to hear, <laughs> hear this. Uh, <laughs> I might go get them and let them know that I'm on. So uh, proud to present the annual report to you all. Um, 
you'll be getting a printed copy soon. It's at the print shop. But uh, just a few things that, that I want to highlight for you all uh, when it comes to it. Um, first, like every year since I've been the chief and really every year since I've been here, guess what? Our call volume has increased by about 10%. Uh, it's a little higher than it, than it has uh, in the last few years, but still it's a, it's a manageable um, increase as long as we're proactive and future thinking. Um, so um, some of the things that I get asked a lot that I know you all also get asked a lot or asked questions about or just topic of conversation, why are Ozark police officers on US 65 all the time, right? Well, uh, if you guys take a look at this, you'll be able to let everyone know that 29% of our traffic stops in 2023 occurred on 65 Highway. Why is that important? Because about 25% of our call load or our call volume is generated from 65, whether that be accidents, dangerous vehicles, um, things in the highway, moving assaults, whatever that may be, about 25% of our call volume is generated from 65 in some form, shape, manner, right? Um, so it is our responsibility to proactively police 65 in hopes of decreasing our, our response to calls out there. So it's a little bit of information that, that you guys can take away, answer some questions. 53% um, of our traffic stops are made on, on city streets. So we spend a lot of time in our subdivisions uh, trying to uphold our mission of making it a, a, a safer community to live in and engaging with our community members by being out visible uh, with them in their subdivisions, in their communities where they live, um, and reducing incidences of crime in their neighborhoods. Um, a few other things that we pay a lot of attention to is our response times. Um, and so in 2023, our response times uh, to priority calls for service went up about 37 seconds. Um, so now it takes us about five minutes and 34 seconds to respond to a priority call on average. Some places they're like, that's actually really good. Um, and, and I agree, it's, it's not bad, but five minutes and 34 seconds is a long time when you're waiting on someone to get there to help you. Um, so we're constantly looking at that. We look at our geographical zone assignments. We look at our deployment of staff. And that is one of the main things that we're trying to do is to try to decrease those response times. So when someone calls and says, I need an Ozark police officer, we want them there as quickly as possible. On a good note, our non-priority uh, response times actually did decrease this year by about 16 seconds. So a little over seven minutes uh, if you call and it's not deemed a, a high, high priority, uh, we can get you there, an officer there in about um, uh, seven minutes. So just a couple updates that, that um, a lot of you had that were instrumental in uh, implementing our canine units. Uh, we had 265 deployments last year. If you remember about two years ago when we uh, reintroduced our canine units to our, our uh, department, uh, that's one thing that I talked about a lot. They're a force multiplier for us when we get called to an alarm or a building search or something like that, instead of sending three, four police officers, now I can send a police officer who's trained and equipped with a police dog that can do the job of what multiple police officers uh, used to have to do. Um, so 265 deployments, uh, we're getting good use out of them. Um, and, and out of those 265 deployments, I think we had about 220 what we would consider outcomes, whether that be a narcotics fine, uh, some type of evidentiary fine, a person, a missing person located. Um, and on top of that, we had about uh, over 20 community engagement functions that our canines were able to, to take part in. People love dogs. Um, they really love dogs that are well behaved and do what their owners say. And good thing for us, our police dogs do what their uh, handlers say. So, um, other than that, your police officers uh, received almost 3,600 hours of training last year. Uh, so we continue to be a well-trained, well-educated force uh, to provide services in our community. Um, 
And then finally, as you were supposed to uh, find out tonight, but uh, we did um, achieve our recertification or our reaccreditation through the Missouri Police Chiefs Association for the cycle of 2020 through 2023. They apologize for not being here, but which is the potential for storms. They didn't want to try navigating through it here and home in it. So uh, they will be here in two weeks. So does anyone have any questions? I know that's a very... Okay. Quick I'm, I'm summary. I do. I, I get a couple of them, Chief. Um, in reference to the, the Highway 65, can, yeah. for clarification, we do or do not run interdiction on Highway 65. Uh, be more specific on interdiction. Do we have a specific interdiction unit for no. narcotics purposes only? No, we do not. Gotcha. Because that's a question that's asked several times. And uh, like I said, a couple more right here. The officers that are now utilizing the motors. What kind of success are we having with uh, traffic? Yeah, so uh, the motors aren't included in anywhere in the 2023 annual report because they weren't deployed in 2023. Uh, they will be on our 2024, which will be coming shortly in May, uh, March of 2025 or 2020. Yeah, okay. 2025. Uh, but uh, they're they're doing good. They're effective. Um, they're actually maybe even bigger benefit for us is just the community engagement aspect of it. People are interested in it. People like them. Um, our, our sole operator right now is a master instructor. Um, so he will be able to um, not only teach Ozark police officers and instruct them on how to ride the motors, he can also instruct instructors on how to instruct people to do that. Um, so our second officer, has completed all the training requirements. He just hasn't taken his, his physical test uh, to become motor certified. Um, and a lot of people just assume I'm talking like you go down to the DMV, take a test, and you're able to ride a motorcycle. Um, sometime I will show you all a video of some of the things that it takes. It's amazing. It's amazing watching what these police officers can do on a motorcycle in an area no bigger than this. And, oh, okay, ours? All right, I would like to direct you to our Facebook page. <laughs> um, it, it, it's amazing, but it, it's been successful, um, not only uh, from an enforcement standpoint, but an educational and an engagement standpoint as well. Gotcha. Uh, just to elaborate on that, uh, if you've not dealt with, with an officer that rides a motor, they have to keep their heads on a swivel more so than others. Uh, having been motor certified as an officer, I can attest to that. Uh, anytime we get a, an officer certified on a motorcycle, I think we need to get them out there as much as we can. It is an excellent PR tool yeah. and it's an excellent enforcement tool. Uh, the last question I have on the PD side, have we, or last year, do we have an increase in domestic and assault calls? Uh, so, I actually uh, talked to someone about this last week. Um, no, because our numbers are skewed from COVID. Yes. Okay. Um, so when I look at the last five years of that, I really look at averages because 2020, 2021, and even early 2022, all those numbers were very, very high because we still had a lot of people that were in their homes all the time, working from home, you know. Um, it was just a very different dynamic of something that, that we haven't seen. So assaults and domestic assaults skyrocketed during that time. 2023, they actually trended down. I attribute a lot of that to some normalcy starting to reoccur in our communities. And most professionals, uh, law enforcement professionals that I've talked to experienced the same type of trends and really attribute it to the same thing. Um, so, uh, no, we have not seen an increase, but I, I do attribute that to probably uh, COVID and the effects that it had on the community. No, the officers do an outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Alder. Are we still running short on officers at the present time? Yes, so um, we are authorized for 39 police officers. Currently we have 35. Um, this year in 2024 we started a new recruitment um, campaign and so far that is i don't want to say it's paid dividends yet however we've processed more applicants in the uh, in the month of march 
than we did in all of 2023. So uh, what it told us is there are a lot of people out in the community who want to be police officers. They're willing to serve their community. They just don't know how to go about some of the obstacles that someone who wants to do that might face, such as quitting their job, right? Going to the academy, paying for the academy, which is $10,000. Um, those, are, those are pretty big obstacles for some people. Uh, with our new recruiting campaign that we worked with with the communications department, and I've worked with the uh, interim city administrator extensively on, um, we found a, a fairly large group of people who are interested in being police officers. Mm -hmm. And now that they see a pathway to it, um, we are seeing at least early success in the fact that we were testing a lot of people receiving dozens and dozens of applications weekly uh, for people who want to be police officers here in Ozark. Okay, so you are planning to hire um, four more? I'm hoping. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, Good night. so the, the, whole pro the whole problem with that is, is it's not like any other position. Um, I may want to hire somebody, but it may take me almost a year before they are legally able to work as a police officer. They have not been through a police academy. Um, and so it's a little different when it comes to that because right now I'm looking at people who have no police experience, they've never been to a police academy, and we are looking at investing in them for almost a year before I can ever use them as a police officer. Are you gonna have space for them? No, <laughs> but we have cars for them to drive. I'm glad you asked that because our officers spend about 85 to 90% of their time during an eight hour shift in their patrol vehicle. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, uh, um, Hutchison. I've also had feedback on the Yeah. Taught at the high school a couple of classes this last week, and the kids there think they are the coolest thing. Yeah. Then I had lunch with a 30 mid 30s guy who said, Bill, I'm in Detroit. Friends and all I, and, and everyone I know think it's a real bad idea. <laughs> so here, here's a perfect response to that, okay? Uh, motors are not intended uh, for response to criminal activity, right? Motors are a traffic safety function, okay? Uh, what's probably the number one complaint you get from anyone about Ozark? I mean, any of you. Me, it's traffic, speeders, people doing this, you know, oh, the traffic's terrible, the crashes are terrible. Motors are simply a, a traffic safety measure, uh, a traffic um, crash reduction, reduction tool. Uh, we do not use them in response to crime. So other than a motor vehicle crash, which may have a criminal charge attached to it, or potentially a traffic stop that leads to like a driving while intoxicated case, we're not responding to, to crime on that. And I don't know of any law enforcement agencies in the United States that use it as a crime response vehicle. Um, if you get to your third world countries and stuff, they do that, but it, it's, it's not equipped to do that. If, if you were to arrest someone for a crime, you couldn't transport them. We thought about installing sidecars, but uh, <laughs> we didn't like the optics of that. I'm joking. I think his major complaint was that they are hidden too easily uh, while they're watching for traffic violations mm -hmm. that they felt like he felt like that was entrapment and uh, they don't like that that they can you know be easily hidden from yeah people. integrity's tough for a lot of people you know <laughs> doing the right thing <laughs> when they don't think anyone's watching is tough um, but typically if you look to see where our motor is parked uh, most of the time he's down here in a school zone on Jackson because we have high school kids going back and forth all the time and people are driving too fast. Other than that, he's in directed patrol areas where we have identified through citizens complaints, complaints from aldermen, complaints from other city staff, and citizen complaints of where we have traffic issues. Um, so you're not gonna find him hiding behind a, a, a big sign or anything like that. He's gonna be wide open and his helmet is white. So he's easy to spot from all the people that are not wearing helmets, who should be. I will pass that on. Yeah. And that will. I would love to really talk will. to those people. Okay. <laughs> I will put you in touch with him. And I didn't know that aldermen could complain about things to you. That's, that's good knowledge to have. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Just 
bring to my attention. No, Sorry. Con concerns, concerns, not there's complaints. There's bad weather coming tonight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any, Thank you else? all. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Um, so, final words. Uh, final words. Uh, Mayor wanted to say welcome to our new communications director, Maria Nider. Yes. It's her first day. Yeah. Uh, we also have with us our new communications manager, Ben Ward, as well. Yeah. So be yeah. sure to say hello to him after the meeting. Uh, we've already, you know, started making plans about how to utilize these new resources in the department. We're really excited. I, I think that department has a really bright future ahead of it. Um, I'm very excited to see where we're going to be in the next 12 months. It's going to be great. Um, the other thing I would note, um, and I wanted to say thank you to our communications staff because they were here in this room with me for three, four hours today with our technology people uh, figuring out this system here, our microphones. I believe, and please, if you're watching on YouTube, comment on our Facebook page uh, that this should be the first meeting and I don't know how long that is actually audible. Uh, it doesn't sound like we're underwater. We spent many hours doing different tests on our phones and our computers, uh, listening to the speaker uh, you know, response in here. I believe we figured it out. I will say it does require a little cooperation from you guys. These microphones are designed to operate with you approximately three inches away from it. Oh, wow. And I know that seems close. So the suggestion from our tech people was if you would pull it back to approximately a little more than halfway from the back of the thing, uh, and I, I've been talking to Hayden and a couple of others who've been listening to this meeting to get feedback. Thankfully, I believe they could hear pretty much everybody, including you, Bruce. You, you know, God love you. You, you, you tend to sit back a little bit when you talk. They were able to hear you. It does diminish the sound level a little bit, but they are able to hear. So if we could just make sure when we're utilizing the mics that we sort of lean forward um, and, and speak into them, uh, that would be really useful because I could tell you, I watched our planning and zoning meeting last Monday, and I could only hear about every other word being said by the commissioners. And if I was a resident, I wouldn't be too happy with that, especially given how much money we paid for the system. So we are dedicated to getting this thing working right. Um, we think we're very close, if not there. Um, and we would just, you know, like I say, appreciate making sure your microphone's on and, and you sort of lean forward to talk into it. I have yes, a question ma'am. about that. Yes. When I was at the planning and zoning, well, every time I'm out in the audience, I can't, I can't hear, the people behind can't hear. It, it, do you think what you did today will help that? I believe it did. Um, Could you guys hear everybody today? Steve, you can hear back there, good. Yeah. Could you, okay. Yeah, we, we, we made very specific adjustments to the speakers and, and the, I won't bore you with the technical details, but there were a number of settings that were enabled that were actually muffling oh, the okay. sound. And it was okay. getting even worse when you filtered it through Zoom and did the compression there to get it to YouTube. Uh, we've disabled all that, we believe, you know, we're on a really good track here. Good to know. I thought I was going deaf. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I just had one question. What is our population? Of Ozark? Of Ozark. 23,000. Yeah, 23, 6, signs something like that. 19. Yeah, that's a MoDOT thing. Um, they are not they changing are, signs anymore. Right. That, is that correct? Yeah, I was just going to say, it used to be, MoDOT used to provide those signs, I believe they stopped doing it, and they left it at the 2010 numbers for some reason. We received notice a few years ago okay. that they weren't going to be updating those signs, and actually, I don't believe we can request any additional signs. They're, they're stopping that. Is there any way we can address it? I was going to say, knowing MoDOT, you could probably pay, you know, uh, you know, provide the sign if it meets all of the AASHTO standards. You know, Cameron and uh, Jeremy might know a little more about that than I do. I think they could take it down, but I don't think they're allowing you to put anything else up. No. Because they say they go online and, and, and Google the population. Well, so it's, if it's inaccurate, it needs to go away. But if we can fix it, I think we should. That's just yeah. my opinion. We can reach out to our contact at MoDOT and ask for their most current policy and get you an answer. All right, thank you. Okay, are we all good? Yes, ma'am. Please vote. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, is there a motion? Move to adjourn. And second. Okay, there's a motion to adjourn by Alden Galloway. Alden Snyder seconded. Uh, all in favor, do so by show of hands. And it